nonverbal language says a lot to children. Children see when you clutch your purse when a black man is, is walking by. One of the net effects of racism is misery. And the inverse to that is creating conditions where people can enjoy their lives, no matter their skin color. Engage the child about these topics because they're gonna have questions. And I'd rather you answer those questions than a white supremacist lurking online. What's at stake is joy. It's all coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson faced tough questioning during the Senate confirmation hearing on her nomination to the Supreme Court. Everyone expected that. What came as a surprise was the sudden focus on a picture book. Anti-racist baby. Anti-racist baby. Written by today's guest, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. Held aloft in accusation by Texas Republican Ted Cruz, the gesture was supposed to be some kind of incrimination indicative of an election year assault on public education, especially anti-racist education, and the mud throwing that we're likely to see more of coming up. How to respond effectively, especially as journalists, especially as journalists serving communities of color who are affected most by all this. For that, I am happy to welcome back to the Laura Flanders Show for our monthly feature, Meet the BIPOC Press, my colleagues, Mitra Kalita and Sarah Lomax Reese, co founders of URL Media, a network of black and brown owned and operated media platforms, and Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. Dr. Kendi is professor in the humanities at Boston University, where he just this year resurrected The Emancipator in collaboration with the Boston Globe. The original abolitionist paper was founded more than 200 years ago. He's also the author of five number one New York Times bestsellers, including Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You, which was number two on the American Library Association's list of most challenged books in 2020. His next two books coming out in June are How to Raise an Anti-Racist and the picture book Good Night Racism. And did I mention he's a 2021 MacArthur Genius Award winner? <laughs> um, Dr. Kendi, thank you for joining us. Mitra, Sarah, thank you for joining us again. Season three on public television stations and year two of our Meet the BIPOC Press collaboration. Um, Mitra, to you, want to kick off our conversation today? Sure. I just want to pick up on the thread of Ted Cruz holding up that book uh, because it really felt this iconic moment from the confirmation hearings. Um, and I was just I was just thinking about this because the last time I was so riveted by confirmation hearings, of course, was Brett Kavanaugh, where we're getting into um, you know, the almost the record and the upbringing of the justice, right? And in this case, know, because... um, you know, that moment with the book felt like we were all about the identity of the justice. We went immediately from Ted Cruz and that image to then people taking the screen grab of how the book was doing on Amazon um, because it just soared in sales and people were like very supportive of the premise of the book. And so that, um, again, just on my social feeds felt like another place where this country's at, right? There's the, can a baby be racist question? And then um, let's buy the book so that our babies are not racist. <laughs> I mean, I had a question for you, Dr. Kendi. Where were you? I mean, did were you glued to the screen or did someone tip you off that this was happening? So someone tipped me off and many people did. I was actually in a, in a pretty important meeting that I couldn't even, you know, end. And so I actually don't think I saw it live until several hours later. What'd you make of it? I mean, initially I was just horrified uh, to, to see the way in which uh, my sort of books and other books were distorted and even weaponized because a senator was trying to undermine, uh, you know, someone who was nominated for the court and their record was untouchable. So he was trying to figure out other ways, you know, to, 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 to affect um, her. And, and, and I think, you know, the fact that he would use my work and distort it. Um, and then to see how difficult it was for her in that moment, I think was very difficult for me to see. 
I'm wondering, like, how do you, in a nation that has so many racist systems in place, how are you in, in, at the forefront of these conversations? How do you get through to people like a Ted Cruz or to uh, these, these school boards around the country that are banning your books and other books? What is the, the, the through way to actually make change among the people that need to be changed most profoundly? So I think when it comes to those school boards that are banning books, I think it's we have to change power. I mean, you know, there are many people who are organizing right now and who are thinking about ways for them to sort of sit on that school board so that they can defend all books um, by, by all people so that our kids will have access to, to everything. As it relates to people like Ted Cruz, I think it's a little bit different. I, I think, you know, Ted Cruz is going to swim with the political winds. And so if we transform the, the political winds and it becomes obvious to him that he can no longer uh, sort of stoke up sort of white fear in order to uh, win elections, then he's gonna he's not gonna do it anymore, right? And and that's the that's the that's the issue with people like him. He's a propagandist, and he doesn't really have a principle. And so we really need to change the conditions and really the mat in which he's working under. I find it interesting though that you've really leaned into the children's aspect of, and the and the power of individuals that you speak of often. Um, has that been intentional to just start anti-racism earlier and earlier? This certainly wasn't in the plans. And it didn't really come into the plans until I really became a father in, in 2016, right around the time my second book, Stand From the Beginning, came out. But then also uh, when people in the summer of 2020 you know, I had to engage quite a few people because I think many people were, were learning about anti-racism. And at the beginning of the summer, many people were asking me, how can they be anti-racist? By the end of the summer, more and more people were like, how can I raise my child <laughs> to be anti-racist? How can I be a better uh, educator for children? And so I saw that that's what people were looking for. And I try to be responsive you know, to, to what people are needing and, and looking for. How do you swing that, though? How do you balance that with your teachings that you've also, you know, leaned into about racism as something that we do rather than something that we are, or not only something that we are, um, about power structures uh, as well as personal behavior? Can, can you talk about that? We should understand the structural and the individual. So if we understand racism as a structure uh, and, and if we understand racist at an individual level, you have a single or individual racist policy, even idea, or even an individual who is being racist because they're reinforcing uh, this larger structure, just as to be anti-racist as an individual, is to challenge that larger structure. So I'm really trying to allow individuals to see the role that they have to play in creating a new structure, a new equitable structure. We have Black books and other books being banned. What does it say about empowerment across uh, racial lines, particularly for Black Americans? For the longest time, we as Americans have been debating freedom. We've been, we've been those who have been advocating freedom from oppression, and then there are those who've been pushing for freedom to oppress. <laughs> and what's striking is that the slaveholder, of course, was demanding freedom to enslave people. And imagine that any restrictions on their ability to enslave and violate people was a restriction on their freedom. And, and one of the things that those slaveholders imagine would restrict their ability uh, to enslave people was education, <laughs> was educating enslaved people, was even educating poor non-slaveholding whites. And so even in How to Be an Anti-Racist, I, I write about how, you know, someone at the time during the enslavement era stated, stated that these slaveholders legislate for ignorance to, in, in order to maintain slavery. 
this desire to enslave, I hadn't thought about that framing in this year. And yet when you think about book banning and the eradication of knowledge and real history, that's exactly what it is. I mean, all four of us here are in the business of believing that narratives and media narratives are transformational, right? For our people, they're uplifting for our people. And so there's something about um, book banning in this midterm election year as an issue that feels like it's eradicating identity. And that to me is so, so dangerous. I'm curious, Dr. Kendi, if if you see a connection between the the re- reduction and almost the elimination of black bookstores and, and other independent bookstores and this wave of book banning, is all of this interconnected? It certainly is. Knowledge is power. And but I think we should really even think about it at a whole nother level, which is that, you know, knowledge is, is only power if it's put to the struggle for power. And you see bookstores in particular uh, serving as places that allow people to transform that knowledge, you know, into power, because you typically are spaces where organizers and, and people who are building power for the communities, you know, come together. And so they certainly have become sites of uh, for 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 targets just as certain books that are empowering people uh you know are, are becoming sort of sites you know of targets and 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 that's why i think people are resisting so strongly is that where the emancipator comes in and can you tell us a bit more about that project what it's been like to work with the boston globe and and what your goals are for well i mean that's precisely you know just as people are trying to De- destroy uh, we're, we're, we simultaneously are trying to construct and, and construct a new and obviously even construct new media organizations and or even sort of build on the, the historic brilliance of word of course I went to temple and so it was it was a friendly companion you know to me but um, and, and and the emancipator in particular specifically being able to work with our editors in chief uh, you know Amber Payne and, and, and Deborah Douglas, to, to really reimagine uh, the, the anti-slavery newspaper that had this sort of North Star of, of creating a nation without slavery and really platformed those people who were thinking that and creating that, for us to sort of do the same with the emancipator of, of really bringing together those thinkers and writers and, and campaigns that are really trying to you know, to abolish racism and are focused on that is is really exciting because we, you know, it's a sort of more solution oriented form of journalism. And I think that's what we need. Do you have a goal of what you, I mean, an idea of what you would like to see, I don't know, for lack of a better word, big J journalism emancipate itself from? I mean, if we could do with, with the Emancipator and other similar publications, what anti-slavery newspapers did, you know, prior to the Civil War, you know, I'd, I'd feel as if we, we accomplished something. All right, so, so I'll take the the tradition of Tom Paine, you take the Emancipator, maybe we could get somewhere. Um, I would love to go back just for a second though, to two things. One, the, the censorship attacks. Uh, you mentioned, you made the point, Mitra, that as soon as um, Anti-Racist Baby became a popular, you know, meme, sales went up. But so too attacks in libraries, in schools, none of that has stopped. And even though, Dr. Kendi, your book seems to have not been in the top 10 most challenged books of last year, you were number two in 2020, um, right up there with Harper Lee and John Steinbeck and Toni Morrison. Um, What can be done and what is being done to confront censorship and book banning per se, Dr. Kendi? So I, I do think there's a lot of organizing that, that is happening, particularly at the local level, whether that's people who are forming organizations to pressure school boards or library officials to, to, to not ban books, or even people who are organizing book clubs, even students and young people who are organizing banned book clubs, um, because you're not going to take anything away from a kid and expect them not to try to grab it themselves. And, and so I think that's happening. You know, I'd like to see 
more lawsuits. I'd like to see more preventative legislation. You know, I'd, I'd like you know to see uh, ways to address this, this at a federal level. Um, but I think there there are many things that are being done. If if I could jump in, um, because I'm I'm so um, taken by the there was a quote that uh, a, uh, a wonderful writer and and speaker her name is Ruth King she says that that racism is a heart disease, and so I'm I'm wondering how do you um, combat that that heart disease when you have so many people who are benefiting from structural racism. Um, and is it something that generationally it will, it will work itself out? Are we seeing younger and younger people adopting different frameworks and ways of viewing race and racism? Or is it something that, that does have to be um, attacked and uprooted each generation? That's a hard question because I think on the one hand, I believe for the first, the, the election of, of Donald Trump, I believe in 2016, a majority of white youth voted for Donald Trump. But then there of course are a significant number of youth of color you know, in the United States and, and those youth of color combined with even some progressive youth are, are generally more likely than really any other age set to, to you know, express even anti-racist ideas. But then what's also the case is at least in 2020, one poll found that from my understanding, the highest uh, recorded percent of Americans were saying racism exists in a huge problem. But by the end of the summer, it had dipped down double digits, right? And it's really hard to say what it is now. And so there's a, there, there, there is a governing majority of people, but the problem is they don't, we're not able to necessarily govern because of all sorts of gerrymandering and vote suppression. A lot of the framing around um, the, the critical race theory and all of that is around like white fragility and and you know you can't uh tr tell my child that they are they should be ashamed of their whiteness and their heritage and and this this whole contextualization around white people actually being victimized by critical race theory or the the literature that that you've written um how do and and that's a powerful talking point how do we combat that framing? Because it's, it's, it's really been, I think, incredibly successful in, in changing the narrative. Well, I'd say in two ways. First, that we talk about that that is a talking point of white supremacist organizations that is now mainstream. So historically, white supremacist organizations have went to white people and said, you are the primary victims of racism, or you are being impacted by genocide, or you, know, you are being harmed uh, by immigration. So therefore you, the white race needs to come together and defend itself. And that's what we as a white supremacist organization are seeking to do. And now that boogeyman that apparently is harming white people is CRT. And so, you know, this is the mantra of white supremacy. And I don't think many people are willing to acknowledge just how mainstream this white supremacist talking point is. I think the second thing is the fact that actually anti-racist ed education is actually helpful and protective for white children. So in other words, if you are a white child and you're constantly being bombarded with this idea that you are special because you're white, an anti-racist education could say nobody's special or not special because of their skin color. Through an anti-racist education, you can learn about white abolitionists who fought against slavery, white civil rights activists who fought against uh, 
Jim Crow. You can then see yourself through them and then fight today against racism. I think there are probably people watching Dr. Kendi who are curious about raising their kids, especially their white kids differently. It's not your job to tell us how to do that. But I'm sure there are questions that you can help people answer for themselves. Man, where, where do we even begin? I, I think it's important for first parents to realize that their nonverbal language says a lot to children. What that means is children see, for instance, who you're inviting to your home, who you're not inviting to the home. Children see when you clutch your purse when a black man is, is walking by. Uh, one study shows that a white child's uh, perspectives about race are more uh, correlate more to the number of friends of color that their parent, that their, that their mother has than what their mother actually says about race. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of nonverbal language. We are not even doing with your child or saying to your child is impacting how they see race. And, and But I also think I write about in how to raise an anti-racist, it's important to create, to child-proof the environment, which means creating a diverse uh, anti-racist environment for the child from the school to the neighborhood to even what books you're reading to your child. Uh, you know, it's also important to engage the child about these topics because they're gonna have questions. And I'd rather you answer those questions than a white supremacist lurking online. I just wanna say one of the things that Dr. Kendi's work, especially with children represents is the place for white people in the conversation that it really feels like if this year is about white nationalists getting people together and saying, you know, we got to get together. There's no place for us that that his work is a counter to that. And I um, I just I think that's very powerful because it's actually utilitarian as opposed to theoretical. Um, and then just as a mother of two girls, I mean, and we at URL Media, we pride ourselves on being an organization that centers blackness. I'm obviously not black, um, but the work that I think families have to do is so essential to the preservation of democracy right now. And, you know, the books that you read your children, where you send your kids to school and in our family, you know, there are an equal number of black dolls and brown dolls to white dolls in our house. It's just how we operate. Um, and to connect that to saving the Republic might feel very lofty, but I actually think those two things are absolutely related. I have to go back to Judge Jackson before we close. Um, and I thought of her as I was reminded of something that you've written, Dr. Kendi, in How to Be an Anti-Racist. You say, I'm no longer policing my every action around an imagined white or black judge, trying to convince white people of my equal humanity, trying to convince black people I'm representing the race well. I thought of her in that context and how she had to do those things in front of all of us for so many days and did it so gracefully. But I wondered how you thought about that scene and whether you imagine in your lifetime, in our lifetime, that we will be rid of it, rid of scenes like that. I mean, that's, that's the goal. Uh, and uh, it is the goal for us to, to create a different type of scene, you know, for there to be the, the next time a black woman is, is nominated to the Supreme Court, that the questions are, 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 are about her credentials, her judicial uh, perspectives, her decisions. Um, and she's not sort of asked questions like, how do you define a woman? Or questions about baby books. Um, you know, I think that's what, that's what, we, that's what we're sort of striving you know, to create, and she won't feel this weight, you know, on her shoulders uh, that, that I suspect Judge Jackson may, may have felt, um, you know, and it's, it's too much for any individual to have to hold. And so many women, particularly Black women, you know, have had to hold this weight, um, this weight that we should be lifting off their shoulders. Final thoughts. What is at stake in this moment for you, Dr. Kendi? And uh, what is it that fuels you to do what you do so beautifully? I mean, to me, it's the same thing. Like, I, what's at stake is joy. I mean, you know, what, at the end of the day, the, the, 
one of the net effects of, of racism, aside from people literally losing their lives, is misery. And, and so the, the, the inverse to that is, is creating a joyful life um, and to creating conditions where, where people can enjoy their lives, no matter their skin color. Well, this has been another thoughtful episode of Meet the BIPOC Press. I thank you all for your work and for partnering with the Laura Flanders Show in these conversations. Um, Sarah, Mitra, always wonderful to be with you. And Dr. Kendi, thank you for giving us some of your time today. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org.